number of things, and I'm going to replicate some of what Leon said, and maybe give some different conceptual models to compare and contrast, because whichever model we use, it's got its strengths, it's got its limitations, it's good to know what they are. So basic ecosystem service concepts and their representation. I should say I'm not a soil scientist, I'm, a, I'm a, actually a wetlander. I'm sort of a, a, a wet guy. Um, in fact, I was walking in a river before I got the plane, so people in the bar would tell you I had muddy feet yesterday, I didn't have time to wash them. Um, my background to ecosystem services goes back to Uganda in the late 80s, as a country came out of civil war. The World Bank was ploughing a lot of money in there um, to convert these wastelands, these papyrus swamps, into productive systems, into rice growing systems, so that it could join the first world economy, essentially. Of course, within about a year or two, they were clay basins. They didn't have the resilience. And meanwhile, um, Uganda became the first country in the world to have, A, a sustainable development policy, but secondly, a national wetland strategy. So in the Ugandan wetland program, we kind of scratched our heads. Because the World Bank view, the first world economy view, was convert it into something to sell, it has a value. And yet, once we then began to talk to people, yes, they grew crops, they traded crops locally and even on global markets. But the wetlands served many, many functions uh, for subsistence, for an informal economy, for building materials, for fishing, for a wild fowling and so forth, as well as spiritual, cultural, aesthetic values. A friend of mine who actually ended up working at IHE has the last king of Uganda's flutes, which are made out of papyrus. So these services from nature, which of course weren't in the first world model being driven by the World Bank. So that led to uh, one of the earlier classifications of ecosystem services for tropical wetlands. Of course, what happened subsequently, once that mainstreaming began to happen, the coral reef people developed their classifications, the temperate rangelands people did, the, uh, you know, the rainforest, the temperate forests, and there was an explosion across bioregions and habitat types, um, mainly as a sort of pedagogic and international development uh, tool. And it's important to remember this actually came out of helping people. It's about people. So what are ecosystem services? Well, your classic definition comes from the Millennium Assessment, what ecosystems of services and benefits people obtain from ecosystems. So the first thing we can say is that they're unashamedly anthropocentric. They're not about three-toed sloths. Um, they are systemic, importantly, more on that later. But they play on the interconnectedness, not just of all of the other services, but the fact that each service relates to different sets of beneficiaries. So if Simone's rights are being well served by you know, converting a landscape to you know, commercial production, then your rights might be undermined because the services that that landscape produces might be undermined and so forth. So it's important to remember they've got ecological, social and economic contexts. And I'm using the term economics, not accountancy because it's not all about the um, gilder or the uh, euro or the pound or the dollar. You are probably familiar with this. This is a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment classification. Now, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was kicked off in the year 2000 by the UN to address two questions. What's the status and trends of global ecosystems, major habitat types? Secondly, what's the prognosis of that for human well-being? And it's kind of a scary read, I have to say. Um, but in order to make an assessment to compare across bioregions and habitat types, open ocean rainforest, a lot of that diversity of classification schemes had to be harmonized into one consistent set. And that is the, the consistent set used, um, and I'll just break them down uh, in, a little bit in the next slide, but it's worth noting that you can use them flexibly, you can adapt them. So when I work in India or South Africa, where I, I do, I add two regulatory services, which is salinity control and fire control, because they're important things nature does, and if we miss them out, bad things can happen. Likewise, energy harvesting was never in the Millennium Assessment set, and of course, if you put a hydropower scheme in a river, that's energy harvesting from nature, wind turbine, and so forth. So they're a flexible set. 
This is a slide from a stakeholder public engagement workshop I was doing on Saturday, because it actually says it in much more tangible terms. Stuff, provisioning services, things we get from nature, like the tea, like the water, like the cup that the tea's in, like the heat in the, in the tea and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, pharmaceuticals, that's uh, Taxol, it's a particular chemical in a yew tree, better known as tamoxifen, which is an anti-cancer drug. So all of this natural wealth, all this um, evolutionary intelligence of nature, maintaining stuff, regulatory services. The public don't like the term regulatory services because they think in terms of the EPA or, or whatever coming and hit them with a big stick. So, you know, maintenance of hydrological cycles of air quality, of climate, of pest regulation and so forth. Then as, as Leon has, has outlined cultural services and, and with the public, we're kind of using the term enriches because we're not kind of consuming them in a physical sense, but they enrich our lives. That's the Thames in the middle of London, which gives it certain character, um, recreation and so forth. And of course, supporting services, internal life support processes, cycles, soil formation, soil regeneration, habitats for wildlife. But I always use the analogy on this one of the iceberg. The bit at the top where the ocean liners crash into is only one tenth. And most of nature and the things it does aren't things we consume directly. But really the whole purpose of ecosystem services is to value th this multiplicity of things, but importantly to value what's producing it as well. We'll come back to that later. Okay. This is the diagram from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, again, these supporting services, the, really the bit of the iceberg that's under the water, is producing these other services provisioning, regulatory, cultural, and various of them feed through to constituents of human well-being. It says well-being there, but it's not about polar bears, frankly. It's about us. And yes, we care about polar bears, so polar bears are in there, but it's about us. OK, various takes on that have, have, have been made over history. Um, the UK. Uh, did a national ecosystem assessment in 2011. And this is the conceptual model of it. We don't consume a lot of the services. So some have been called intermediate or primary services. Others, final services from which we derive goods, tradable goods, which have economic value, as well as contributing to health and also the shared social value. Us as a group, might value something collectively that if questionnaired individually wouldn't be obvious to us. Um, and there's been a follow-on project where we've made some real progress with that. That's quite a simplification and I'll talk about some of the weaknesses of it later. But it's just to show you there's lots of different takes on this, on this model. Services from soil. Actually, I don't say much about soil in this at all, but um, I'll say something about services. Uh, I've been at this game sort of 20, 26 years now, and when I'm talking to biodiversity audiences, the first thing they say, well, where's nature? Where's biodiversity? We must have biodiversity in there. And then I've got a, the, geo, the geodiversity people are, are kind of still getting into this. They've not really got their heads into it. People who deal with rocks and that sort of hard stuff. Where's geodiversity? We must put that somewhere. And we're talking about soil. So where the hell's soil? Why isn't it soil on one of those lists? And the answer is very simple. Because biodiversity, geodiversity, and soils are everywhere. They are what it's doing. And the language I often use is think of services as the verb of nature. Nature is there. Take away nature, it's not doing anything. But if nature is there, it is doing stuff. And this is what it's doing. So the answer is soil is absolutely everywhere. And I'm increasingly wondering whether I should replace my iceberg with soil. Because it's, you know, a good analogy, except it's much more difficult to illustrate, isn't it? Much more difficult. So in other words, where's nature? Nature is everywhere. 
This is about what it's doing for us. Just some of the more obvious services from the soil. Well, one of the supporting services is, of course, soil formation. And we're quite good at reversing that process, aren't we? But soil formation is, is a natural process. Uh, soil provides habitat for wildlife. It's the basis for nutrient water cycling. From a regulatory point of view, it has a major role as a carbon store and other aspects of, of climate regulation. And of course, flood risk, water storage and the slowing down of flows. Cultural services, well, land contributes to distinct, uh, soil contributes to distinctive landscapes which might have a heritage, local character value. Obviously, research and education, we wouldn't be here otherwise, would we? And various forms of recreation use landscapes in their general sense. And of course, the provisioning services, we grow our food, our fiber, some of our fuel, increasingly pharmaceuticals, chemical feedstocks in the soil. Take away the soil, we don't have that. And a physical substrate for this building, for the roads and so forth. Use and abuse of soil services. Well, here's another model that is very similar to one that Leon showed. Uh, if you remember, Leon showed a cascade model. I prefer to use concentric circles on this one. I've been using it quite a long time. There's nature, there's ecosystems. They do stuff, they do functions. From the functions, they produce services which produce benefits to people which have values. And again, value, not just cash, economic and non-economic. The economy then trades on a vanishingly small proportion of that. But the consequence of that, of that feedback loop, is that we tend to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Is that a, a story that translates across Europe? Yeah. The productive, we kill the productive system because we only use bits of it. For example, we tend to treat the, the soil surface as a food production system, almost pure and simple. The sea, somewhere to scrape out stuff to eat as well. The earth's crust is a place to mine and the forest is a place for wood fiber, um, for use in buildings, for paper, etc. But of course, because the economy majors on the production of those things and ignores everything else, what tends to get lost is all the other services, such as the habitats for wildlife, the cultural appreciation of nature, the water cycle, the health and regeneration of soils, uh, ambient climate, climate regulation, air quality regulation, characteristic landscapes, all of those things. If it's not in the economy, it's probably being undermined by things that are driven by the economy. And this is one of the weaknesses that Leon and I were talking about at the beginning of the UK NEA model. Because the emphasis here is, well, if, oh, here you go. if we're focused just on things we trade and their worth to society, with the assumption that all of this production stuff is internalized in the price, then we've really ignored what we've learned from two and a half centuries, which is the economy doesn't internalize it. So there are very real dangers, you see. If you, whichever model you go to, you've got to interrogate it and ask, where is nature? What, where's nature in this system? And are we adequately capturing its multiple values? So, yes, I think we have a angst about the UK NEA model that I've shared liberally with my NEA colleagues. Um, so we'll see. Damage to soil services. Well, if we damage the soil, what happens? Soil formation is compromised, soil quality, soil regeneration. We lose habitat for wildlife, we reduce its contributions to cycling. That has serious implications for climate, um, reducing overall resilience. We make it far more prone to erode. That can then contribute massively to water pollution. I'm principally a freshwater guy, but to protect water, I know I have to protect land. So it's a cascade. Uh, damage the soil, damage regional character, recreational value, and reduce resource security, mainly in the way that soil contributes to the final services that are traded. The important thing here is to recognize that everything is connected. So every bit of increment of harm that we do, particularly to the supporting service, actually has ramifications for all other services. So one of the key messages of ecosystem services is in that word system. 
It's the connectedness of things. OK, needs and trends. What do we need from our soils? What do we need from our landscapes? OK, there's a British landscape there. I think it's Britain anyway. It looks a bit like it. We want that to give us stuff. We want that to give us food. We want that to give us water. We want to give it to give us energy. We want it to give us medicines and, and, and herbs and that sort of stuff, the provisioning services. We want it to regulate air quality, microclimate, the global climate system, to regulate pests, to regulate the way water sheds from it, contributing to natural um, flood management. We want to recreate in it. We want to access it. We want to enjoy looking at it. It's hosts our cultural assets, and it's a place for education, quiet reflection. And of course, in the supporting services, we want the soil to keep fertile, keep producing, supporting biodiversity, maintaining those cycles. Nothing controversial there. It's just a restatement of the Millennium Assessment set, really. We want to do that in the face of two billion more people joining the global population by 2050. And in Europe, of around three quarters of a million more joining. The same landscapes that are already eroding quite substantially. But if you extrapolate forward and ask what we want from the land, not only do we want more of all this stuff, we want all of it together. And as we talk about decarbonizing the economy, we also want the soil to produce fuel, feedstock, drugs, and all the things that we just dig up from that dirty black stuff under the, and in the Earth's crust today. So the demands we're making on soil will be multiplied many, many fold when we take account. I think Leon used, used the example of 80% of the energy in a potato is derived from oil, only 20% from incident sunlight. Well, extrapolate that up with all these other things. So the demands that we're making on the soils are really going to escalate massively at the same time as it is degrading in quality and populations rising. So what do we need? We need to provide more things for more people, multiple service, not just the blinkered subset that we've mined from it in the past. We need it to offer us greater resilience because we're facing a changing climate. So we actually need it to do lots of the things that haven't been valued before and to conserve its full potential. Um, OK, some aspects of status and trends of soil. You know this stuff better than me. This is stuff I've mainly pulled off the internet. But 10 billion tonnes of carbon stored in UK soils, more than all the trees and forests in Europe. So that's quite a sort of striking figure for a non-soil scientist. It, you might live with that one. But the public would be like, blimey, never thought of it like that. I do quite a lot of uh, radio and television. Right? This kind of fact is, is, is quite good for waking people up. English peat uplands organic matter has more carbon in it than all the trees in England and France combined. That's big. And yet at the same time, in the east of England, some of our soils have receded by four metres. In you know, two centuries ago, actually less than two centuries ago, they were two metres above sea level, and now they're two metres below sea level. So, and that's the land that we want to produce our food. This is what you deal with, thematic program, like things are happening, not good things. <laughs> Enough said about that one. Interestingly, food production since the 1960s has increased by about two and a half times, which is a kind of modern miracle. It's a scientific miracle of um, the Green Revolution. But the Green Revolution is premised really on two things. One is that soil as a medium, you can keep putting fertilizer and water on and growing stuff and use it in clever combinations, you'll get more food. Secondly, you can always expose more soil when that gets depleted. Knock down a rainforest or whatever, reclaim it from the sea. I hate that term reclaim, as if nature wasn't making use of it. And now what are we doing? We're giving it back to nature with managed realignment, realizing what nature did with it was more valuable to us than we realized. So reclaim is, is one of my list of banned words, uh, much like improved grassland, which basically means ruined. 24% um, of the global land surface is now cultivated, producing 90% of our food. 
but we're not making new soil. And the opportunities to deforest and infill river deltas and all the rest of it for agriculture are pretty much saturated. So in other words, we've got to value and make use of what we've got to deal with those spiraling demands from population and decarbonisation and climate resilience and all the other things. So there's some serious pressures and some serious things that soils do that are simply not in the economy today. We have to find ways of putting them in there somehow. OK. I'm going to just talk about the ecosystem approach. We, we talked about this uh, in a Skype call. You will see the term ecosystem approach, and you will also people use it, see the people using that synonymously with ecosystem services, but it means something different. So I just want to make it clear what it does mean. The term ecosystem approach came out from the Convention on Biological Diversity. It was mentioned in 1992. It was signed up to as a concept in 1995 by most countries that are signatories of the CBD. And in 2000, the definition was revised. It's all about putting ecosystem service delivery into practice. And that means, uh, well, it actually comprises 12 complementary and interlinked principles. It's a system within a system, if you like. But it puts ecosystem service delivery in geographical contexts and in socioeconomic contexts. That's what it's about. So it's not the same as ecosystem services. Those 12 principles, well, you'll get them from the presentation. There's no need to read them all, but there's some familiar things. Decentralization, it's about societal choices. All forms of information, knowledge are relevant. Balance between conservation and use of biodiversity, spatial and temporal scales and all of this stuff. Familiar stuff. I keep emphasizing this word system. In the drafting of the UK um, National Natural Environment White Paper in 2011, in some of the lock-in meetings late on in drafting, a number of us said, are we brave enough to drop the eco bit? Because it is about systems. The danger is if you leave ecosystems in and you're in business and you look at the eco, you think, well, Chris Short likes fluffy creatures. He can deal with that bit. We'll get on with our stuff and you know these, these, these green dudes can sort it all out. And that is a problem with the term ecosystem services because ultimately it's about systems. It's about people. It's about the economic interactions which are always played out in uses and abuses of the natural world. How we share that. That's what sustainability is about. It's a system. It's not about the eco bit inherently even though it's the eco bit that pays all the bills and takes away the trash. Borrowed that one from Gretchen Daly, didn't I? Importantly then, we have to view all services as a fully interdependent system. We still cherry pick. And if you look at most regulatory action right around the world, they'll go, well, we kind of do flood defense, don't we? And they manage water quality and we've got a biodiversity organization there. So we're kind of handling it, aren't we? No, you're not. It's that word system. And there's so many trade-offs that, I mean, we're so familiar with it, there's no point in laboring it, but I will labor it a bit because the system bit is the most important word there. Likewise, complementary and interlinked principles. Now, we kind of get all of those, all the underlying words. You know, thinking at appropriate spatial and temporal scales, you kind of mentally tick, yeah. We've got to do that, haven't we? Um, you know, conservation of ecosystem structure function. Yeah, we've got to look after it. And economic context. Yeah, we've got to do a bit of, bit of that stuff. Stakeholder engagement, all the rest of it. But the same criticism does apply in actual implementation. Are we thinking and acting as a system? Are we just doing a bit of stakeholder engagement there and a bit of economics there or whatever? Are we bringing these into decision making? Or are we still cherry picking? And the answer is... I think apparent with the declining state of the world. OK, just another sort of way of representing this. Um, I've used a very similar table to this to a paper that's just gone in press in a journal called uh, Ecosystem Services. That's it. I think you heard of it. Um, not this table, which is in another paper, which is um, how do you bring systems thinking into the scientific realm 
and into the policy realm. And you need to represent it. Now, Leon used the, um, the petal diagram. It's a pretty good way. If you remember, you know, this, uh, this managed landscape, this intensive landscape, produces a lot of provisioning service, but not a lot of the other services. Whereas a natural one is, is a much more balanced production across all the petals. This is one I use, the traffic lights one. Anyone here colorblind? I, I do apologize if you are. But it's quite nice. I mean, and this is in another paper that is, is with another journal at the moment. There's catchment management planning, which, you know, those of us who are a bit older in the um, early 90s, we were all into catchment management planning. The idea is you've got all of the disciplines of river management together in the same document. And the thing that bound the disciplines together was the staples, because people weren't talking. <laughs> That's what happened. So if you actually analyze what it's all about, it kind of scores fairly red against most of the uh, ecosystem approach <laughs> principles. And then, of course, we moved into integrated water resource management and adaptive water resource management. And we did some things a lot better. And the intent of river basin management under the Water Framework Directive, which claims to internalize the ecosystem approach, you come to a different analysis. And then you look at what actually happens. And you kind of go back to that one, frankly. But hey, you know. Sadly, humans get involved. But we are making progress. And I've got another paper in this series, which is looking at different approaches to urban drainage, the way SUD systems have, have evolved, which tries to tell a narrative. And this is a problem that you're going to face when you start communicating in systems terms. You'll submit to a soils journal, who'll say, well, that's all very nice, but each of those is a paper in itself. And you must be reductive about your systems thinking. So actually finding devices that communicate illustratively how the system behaves is really going to be quite important if you want to affect systems thinking in policy. It's, it's a challenge. You will meet it. Um, there's very few journals that will accept a paper like that. There's one, and I think I've found another one. Um, but it's slowly, slowly. You know, once, once you've got a couple of papers, and then you can quote yourself, and then everyone believes you. You know, you know the game. Um, OK. The need for pragmatic tools. Well, actually, that was about pragmatic tools. It's about who we communicate to, who we tell the stories to, how we tell the stories, how we marshal our considerable depth of knowledge, but how we tell that story in a way that tells that systems interaction story and tells it to people who just don't happen to be our friends already. That's the challenge. I'm sure you're familiar with this map. I've just nicked it off Google, frankly, but um, a soil map of Europe. OK, that is a state map. We need to get two steps on to a, a function map. What are the soils in that state doing when you look at taking account of their slopes and their social, social um, context as well? What functions are happening? And then what services are they producing? So there's a couple of jumps there. But we need to infer that from state and other data and assumptions. Then we can begin to ask questions. Where are the service hotspots? Where are the places that are actually producing quite a lot of services, maybe that aren't in the economy already? Then ask the trends. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? And what's the implications of that for continuing support for human well-being and all of those pressures that we looked at? Then we can ask about land uses, because just because a place naturally is producing a lot of services doesn't mean that society will have left it alone to produce those services if they're not traded in the economy. Society might have decided that actually quite fertile, so let's just sort of dig it up and grow maize there. You know, nice free draining slope so that when it rains, all the soil ends up in the river. You know, wouldn't happen in our country, would it? Um, are this land uses commensurate with the real value, the service value of that soil, and what the soil can support in the long term. Where are the principal areas of conflict? And how can we marshal that then to influence a spatial or qualitative soil strategy? I already mentioned the fact that we kind of give subsidies to people to you know, grow maize on slopes and like, why? Um, why do we do that? But actually, these sort of tools, um, 
that uh, I'm looking for the name that, that, that Leon used, capturing the values for society, if you remember that slide. All this stuff, regulation, incentives, advice, innovation. How do we translate that then into things that actually change the world? Because um, I'm a revolutionary, sorry, it just happens to be the case. Here's a practical example from the West Country of England. The Tamar is an estuary on the Devon-Cornwall border. It's a sort of the pointy bit down the bottom left on the map of England. Um, and this is a, a catchment map of the Tamar. And my colleagues in the West Country Rivers Trust, one of our very powerful NGOs, river-based NGOs in the UK, have been gathering data sets from everywhere and overlaying them to look at ser potential service production. Where is naturally detaining flood water? Where is naturally sequestering carbon? Where is naturally good for biodiversity? Where is naturally good for nutrient cycling and all of these things? Then highlighting service hotspots, where multiple services are being produced, where society is benefiting <coughs> in substantial ways across multiple services simply because of what nature is doing before we start mucking around with it. Overlaying on that current land uses are where, and then looking at where the conflicts are. So a lot of the intensive farming on the Tamar is on the most productive soils, which is often, which is quite good for biodiversity, good for flood defense, flood risk management, good for carbon sequestration, but actually, just using it intensively for agriculture, yes, there's a profit to be gained from it, but the costs are related to society through all the other services. And then asking the question, well, where could we move the farming to? So it's not a case of stopping, it's just saying where can we farm more intensively? Where would society benefit from rewards to landowners for the other services the land produces. So we're not undermining the Tamar catchment for future generations, for current generations. And this kind of visual representation, I would say our politicians like it, that's not true. The politician who is no longer the Minister of the Environment really liked it because it told a story. It told a story of how people benefit and how we undermine that by the way we incentivize people. The current minister is more interested in green growth with the word green sort of forgotten. That's the politics of the UK at the moment, unfortunately. So this sort of tool um, is, well, relatively simple because it's cobbled together from available data sets, but is quite a good way of influencing the policy environment because you're bringing together quite complicated data into a narrative that the decision makers can understand. And you can ask questions of it, of how to get more services from the same landscape, where to move your food production where it won't undermine those. And this holy grail that the politicians like of sustainable intensification may just be possible if we think spatially and if we think of the value of soil and landscape first, nature first, and then think about how we commercialize it second. So there's kind of a few thoughts there. Um, I'm happy to field questions, but we might just do this sort of tag team wrestling on the questions, Leon. Um, whatever, whatever. Okay.